Return to me, says the Lord, and I will return to you. That's the message we find from the book of Zechariah. Today we're thinking about Zechariah and Malachi. Zechariah is probably one of the more unknown of the minor prophets, although a larger book not many people have read and thought about Zechariah, and it is full of messages and imagery, and it talks a great deal about things that the Messiah would do with a lot of prophecy involved in that. And so we're going to be thinking about messages from Zechariah about the Messiah, and then that last book in the Old Testament, Malachi. What does it say? What hope does it offer for us and for God's people? We're glad you joined us today. Stay tuned as we think about these powerful books of the Minor Prophets. To destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of Christ, to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective play stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. Return to me, God says, and hey, I'll return to you. Well, who had fallen away from God? And why did they need to return to him? That's the question that initially comes. And of course, the book of Zechariah, written to God's people, one of the final pleas, encouraging them to get right with God and come back. And God will also reignite that relationship that he had with them. As we think about the book of Zechariah and Malachi today, I want to point out to you that Zechariah is such is a book that is so full of messianic messages, prophecies, that we want to begin thinking about that idea. There's a man in the book of Zechariah whose name is the branch. Look in Zechariah chapter 3. Let me show you some of these messianic messages. Look at verse number 8. God says, Hear, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. Well, who is this branch? Well, the branch is not something new. It's mentioned in chapter 6, verse 12. Mentioned in Revelation 5, verse 5. Isaiah 11, verse 1, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall go out of its roots. Jesse, who came from Jesse? David did. Who came from David? Jesus did. 
Jeremiah 33, verse 15, In those days and at that time I will cause to grow up to David, a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Well, listen now. David, in Jeremiah 33, had been dead a long time. Who's this branch that's going to grow up to David? Luke 1, verse 32 and 33. He'll be called great. Lord God, the highest of his king. He'll be of the seed of David. Of his kingdom, there'll be no end. We're talking about Jesus, the servant of God, who was that, that branch, that rod, that shoot out of the branch or the root of David that is now the house over the house of Israel. Think about another prophecy. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13. Look at what is said here about the Messiah. Of this branch it is said, yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne, so he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Who is this, this branch who's going to be a priest upon his throne and a prince of peace? Who is that? Mentioned in Jack, Zechariah 6.13 and chapter 9, verse 10. Well, who's the prince of peace? Isaiah 9, verse 6. Luke chapter 2, verse 15. We're talking about Jesus Christ. Who is this priest upon his throne who bears the glory? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Jesus is the great high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7. And so he's priest, he's king, he, he bear, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 through 22. You'll call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. He bore the image of God. It, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so, again, we've got a great prophecy about Jesus here. Here's one of the more clear ones. Look in Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming uh, to you. He's just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horsemen from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Well, who is this? Mark chapter 11, verse number one. We've got Jesus in the triumphal entry. He goes into Jerusalem. You remember the scene? As he goes in Jerusalem, they lay down the palm fronds. Jesus rides in on the, the colt of a donkey. And you remember what they cried out? Hosanna in the highest. They recognize at that point, they recognize Jesus as Messiah. And that lined up perfectly with the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9. But here is a sad one. Look in Zechariah chapter 11 at the prophecy here. About the Messiah, in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12 and 13, it is said, Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver, threw them in the house of the Lord for the potter. Do you remember what happened with Judas? Matthew 27. As Judas is about to betray Jesus, they promised him 30 pieces of silver. When Judas realizes what he's done, he cast those 30 pieces of silver back into the temple. He went out and hanged himself, and they bought a, field, bought a field to bury strangers called Potter's Field. Look at the alignment with the prophecy of Zechariah made hundreds of years before. What else do we know about the Messiah? He'd be like David. Look in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 8 and 9. In that day, the Bible says, the Lord will defend between the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Well, Jesus was like David. 
He was of the lineage of David. Luke 1, 32 and 33. He was the root and the offspring of David. Revelation chapter 5, Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. And so as you think about all these prophecies, uh, look at Zechariah 12, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Now listen to this. Then they will look on me whom they've pierced. Do you remember John 19? You talk about fulfillment of prophecy. Listen to John chapter 19. Listen to the exact words of verse number 37. The Bible records this. One of the soldiers pierced his side, verse 34, with a spear. Immediately blood and water came out. And it goes on to tell the scripture was fulfilled. Verse 37, again, another scripture, Zechariah 12, 10. They look on him who they've pierced. And there, there are many more beautiful passages, but here's what we want you to see. The book of Zechariah is so chock full of messianic prophecies. As you read all these things, every one of them was fulfilled perfectly by Jesus Christ. Look at, in fact, look what is said in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. In that day, Zechariah said, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David, for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts. I will cut off the name of idols from the land. They shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. Did you hear those words? In that day, a fountain shall be opened in Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. Acts 2 verse 38, when for the first time in Jerusalem, they preached the gospel. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. We're washed in the blood of the lamb. Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6. Look at Zechariah 13 verse 6. He had wounds in his hands, my friends. And one will say to them, what are these wounds between your arms or hands? Then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The very people who should have accepted Jesus. He was the rejected Savior, chapter 13, verse 7. And so over and over again throughout the book of, uh, of Zechariah, we see Jesus as the Messiah and all of that is beautifully fulfilled throughout Scripture. And so some practical messages that we learn from Zechariah, we learn about the urgency of that gospel message. Look in Zechariah chapter 2, verse number 4 with me. Listen to the urgent message. They said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. What a message of urgency. Do you, do, does that not sound... Does that message not sound like something that happened in the book of Acts? You remember the, the Spirit said to Philip, go over and speak to that man, to the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot, and he ran to him. Again, so many beautiful images that we find. We find throughout the book of, of uh, Zechariah that God is going to be greater than the enemy. Look in Zechariah chapter 3, verse number 2. God will always and his people will always be victorious. Zechariah chapter 3. Look, if you would, in verse number two. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? We learn here that, that God's still in control, and he always will be, that his message and his power is greater than Satan's, and that what God says, Satan has to listen to. 1 John 4, verse 4 says this. To Christians, God says, He who is in you, is greater than he who is in the world. Now look at this passage with me. Look, if you would, in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. And I want you to see the source of God's people's power. Zechariah 4, verse 6. God's talking to some of the leaders of that day. And he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Listen now, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's the spirit of God that has the power today. And friend, we have the words and the power of the Spirit of God right here in the Word of God. This is the Holy Spirit-inspired book. 
2 Peter 1, verses 19 through 21, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. It's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it's by the power of the Spirit of God contained in the pages of the Bible, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel, it's where power is, and, and it's where we need to look to know about God and His plan. Now, for time's sake, I want you to look at the very last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi is about both love and rebuke. God loves his people, and yet he sternly rebukes them for their unfaithful ways. God will say throughout the book of Malachi, there's a key phrase that you'll hear, 12 times God says, you say. Here's what you say. Here's what you think. Here, here are your ways. You say. And then that's in contrast to, thus saith the Lord. And so what man thinks and what man says versus what God thinks and what God says. Key idea, key verse probably. Look in Malachi chapter 1 verse 2. God has loved and he still loves Israel in spite of their sin. Look at Malachi chapter 1. Notice what the Bible says in verse 2. Beautiful words here. God says, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I've loved, but Esau I've hated. They say, how have you loved us? And God says, look at how I've loved you. I called you out. I separated you. I made you a great nation. I fulfilled all the promises through you in spite of their sin, in spite of all the evil that they've done. God still loved his people. Now, the name Malachi it means messenger or my messenger, messenger of the Lord. And it's used in Malachi 3 verse 1. Malachi prophesied during the time of Ezra chapter 7 through 10 and the book of Nehemiah, some around 445 to 432, one of the latter books that we have record of. In fact, Malachi is the some of the last word from God for over 400 years until John comes on the scene. It's some of the last message of God they have for about 400 years. And so that message is a powerful message. And God wants them to see what they've done wrong and how they need to correct that. And so what did the people do wrong in the book of Malachi? Well, basically, they were giving God the leftovers. Look in Malachi chapter one. Instead of putting God first, they're giving God the leftovers. Malachi 1, look in verses 7 and 8. You offer defiled food on my altar, but you say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. What do you mean contemptible? When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. Classic example of people not putting God first, but just giving him what they've got left. And so you say the table of the Lord's contemptible. Well, wait a minute, man. How are we saying that? And God says, let me show you how you're saying it. When you give the blind, let's say you're to make a sacrifice and you really don't want to get rid of a good one out in the field. So you've got this old blind lamb or heifer and let you say, let's give the blind to God. Or you've got a lame animal, can't walk, isn't any good for anything, probably isn't going to live anyway. You've got along this far and you're tired of taking care of it. You say, hey, let's save that and sacrifice it to God. You're giving the lame and you're giving the blind. You're giving God what you don't want. What you've got is leftovers. God says, let me show you the inconsistency there. You take that blind animal or that lame animal and give it as a gift to your governor. Give it, to, give it as a gift to somebody in a high place in the world today. If you came over to somebody's house and you said, man, I've got a good gift for you today. I, you know, we, we, we've got something for you. I've got this old blind animal that I'm tired of taking care of and I want you to have it. <laughs> what would somebody think about a gift like that? That probably not going to work, right? No, nobody wants a blind or a lame animal that you don't want either. Well, that's what they're doing to God. Instead of putting God first, 
they're, they're giving God the leftovers. Malachi 1 verse 13, they say it, it's such a weariness doing this. Being called to service by God is such a weariness to us. It's more than we can handle. That, that's how they're looking at everything. God, why'd you put this burden on us? And a lot of people still think that way today. Oh, to get up and go do this or to go work for God. I'm so tired. It's so weary. No, to do things for God, to give God our best, to serve God, and that ought never to be a weariness to us. What else does Malachi address? Some of the people in the book of Malachi are also not dealing fairly with one another. Look at Malachi chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. <clears throat> Notice the Bible says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another? By profaning the covenant of the fathers. Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he's loved. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord God cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. This is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. He who does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands, yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you've dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? God seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Let, none of, let no one deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says he hates divorce. It covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. What were some of the people in the time of Malachi doing that was wrong toward one another? Well, they were marrying the people of the land which were idolaters, not followers of God. God had commanded them not to do that. And then when they did have a wife from their youth, they would deal treacherously with her. They were divorcing and putting them away. And, and, and the Bible says God hates divorce. Friend, not dealing with others the way that we ought to, whether that be our family, whether that be people in church, whether that be a, a man's relationship with his wife. God wants us to deal rightly with other people. In fact, God wants us to begin by dealing rightly with him. How did God feel about all the things the people in the book of Malachi were doing? The things that they were putting before God, not dealing properly with the covenant, not dealing properly with the wives whom they've married, their, their relationship with God. How did God feel about that? Well, God felt like he was being robbed. Look in Malachi chapter three. Malachi chapter 3, look in verse number 8. Here's what God says. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings? You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there'll not be enough room to receive it. <laughs> These people, just like in the book of Haggai, they're not putting God first. They're not dealing rightly with one another. They're not following the covenant of God. And God says, here's what it's like. Will a man rob God? Imagine this, okay? Somebody comes in on Sunday morning and the collection plate goes around and they reach in and take everything right out. You ever heard of anybody robbing a church building or robbing God? And that'd be the last thing I'd want to do. Every Israelite would get upset if somebody robbed out of the treasury and stole from God. And God says, that's the very thing you're doing. Not giving yourself first, not dealing properly with your relationship with me and others, not keeping the covenant, doing all these things that are contrary to the will of God. In essence, you're robbing me and you're robbing yourself. And God says, here's what I want you to do. Just try it and see. 
follow me and watch the blessings flow down so much so that you won't even, the earth won't even be able to hold it. Friend, God promises always to take care of his people. Now, why is it so important that God's people in the book of Malachi and that people today get right with God? Friend, God has a book of remembrance and people will one day give an account. Look in Malachi chapter 3, verse number 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before them for those who fear the Lord, who meditate on his name. God's, God knows those who are his. God has our name written in the book of life, and, and all of us are going to stand before God and give an account for the things that we've done in this life. And so the book of Malachi is a powerful lesson. You also have some messianic prophecies. Malachi 3 verse 1, you've got the Messiah suddenly coming to his temple. Jesus did that in John 1 and 22, John chapter 1 and chapter 2. You've got him called the Son of Righteousness, which Jesus was, John 8 verse 12. You've got mention of John the Immerser, Mark 1 verse 2. Uh, Malachi as well, 4 verse 5, Malachi 3 verse 1, him being like Eli Elijah's coming. And Jesus said that was John, Luke 1 verse 17. So a lot of prophecy fulfilled as well. Friend, here's the, here's the main message. How are we dealing with God? How are we relating to God? Are we trying to rob God by not giving our lives to him? Friend, if you've not obeyed the gospel, are you really giving God what he deserves? If you've never submitted to Jesus, why not do that? He says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 16. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more from the word of God. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.